welcome to all. Um, <clears throat> today we have a series of talks from experiment and, uh, and theory. We start with the presentation from, whoops, I lost my, I lost my agenda page. Okay, but I know, <clears throat> I know from memory that the first speaker is, uh, is Guy Wormser from LHCB, though I'll, I don't remember the title of your talk anymore, but you're going to say that immediately. So Guy, can you please share your slides? Yes, uh, yes, thank you. So, uh, and just before you start, so we have talks every 20 minutes. The idea is that they're 15 minutes presentation and uh, five minutes discussion. So in order to leave some time for discussion, I will uh, encourage everybody to stick to the 15 minutes and I'll let you know once you have five minutes left. So now it's okay. your turn, Guy. Okay, so uh, I hope you can see my screen okay. So I will mention a semi-leptonic decays in LHCB on behalf of the LHCB collaboration. Uh, here you find a list of the various measurements that were performed in the semi-leptonic sector by LHCB in the last two years. Uh, most of the results have been mentioned yesterday by uh, Lucia in the plenary talk, but I will mention today in this talk only one result. The observation of the decay lambda B to lambda C tau nu is a tau decay into C prong that has been published into archive this morning. And here you have the, the reference. So why is it interesting to perform a lepton flavor universality test with a lambda B and to measure uh, the ratio R lambda C, which is the ratio of branching fraction of semi-leptonic decays with a tau lepton with respect to those with the muon. Uh, first, as uh, you all know, uh, lepton flavor universality, we have a violation int in the meson sector. Uh, if we look at uh, RD and RD star, we have a combined uh, 3.4 sigma deviation from a standard model in the latest uh, update. And this is uh, shown in this uh, uh, picture where the red ellipse is a world average of LHCB, uh, Babar, and Bell measurement. And uh, you have here the standard model prediction, which is uh, quite precise, but uh, far away from uh, this ellipse. So uh, if you use baryons, uh, you have a spin one half spectator, and this uh, gives a very complementary test because on one hand, you have similar precision on the same model prediction. If you use uh, lattice QCD computation for the form factor uh, from the paper of um, Detmold et al. And uh, this was used by uh, Bern Locker and et al. to give a 1% uh, precision on the expected uh, value for the sound model. And on the other hand, you have very different uh, new physics coupling depending on the spin of the new physics mediator, it can be a, a scalar, a tensor, pseudo-scalar vector. And uh, this will uh, give, in fact, a rather independent measure for uh, R in the baryon sector versus R in the meson sector. So this could help uh, to pin down the new physics source. Uh, in addition, this channel is uh, unique to LHCB and has uh, never been searched before. So uh, this is, on this slide, you see an illustration of um, the complementary nature of the R lambda C measurement from the paper of Data et al. Uh, you take into account all measurements uh, regarding RD and RD star, but uh, you see that um, for a scalar coupling, you can have here uh, R lambda C below, uh, 6% below the standard model. And if you use a vector or tensor, you can be at 1.5 times the standard model prediction, so a quite high measurement. So uh, this is a workflow to uh, try to search uh, for this decay. We uh, look for the tar into a 3 decay. 
And the first step is to uh, reconstruct a lambda C. We use a PK pi uh, mode uh, with very tight uh, PID selection. And here is a lambda C spectrum that uh, we use uh, for this analysis. So you see it's uh, clean. Uh, there is uh, still uh, uh, some background under the peak, and we use a sideband here and here to subtract uh, the background under the lambda C uh, peak. Uh, the second step is to add a three pion triplet uh, to form a pion candidate. Uh, there is a very large background that we call prompt with this topology where the three pion uh, are produced at the lambda B vertex. But uh, for uh, the decay we are interested in, you see uh, the tau carries away this three pion away from the lambda B vertex. And this is the feature that we use to reject this background. We ask a five sigma separation between the vertex of the lambda C here and the vertex of the three pi. And um, when we look uh, here on the plot on the right, uh, in function of this delta Z over sigma cut, uh, you see that the prompt background, which is this white component, is completely killed after five sigma and uh, mines uh, the log scale. So we are left with, oh, sorry, uh, we are left with only uh, two components uh, in a light blue, the signal, and in red, it's a background uh, from double charm where the three pion are also carried away from the lambda B vertex by a charm meson. We'll come back to that in one second. So uh, we can monitor, uh, check the rate of um, suppression by using uh, our normalization channel, which is uh, lambda B to lambda C3 pi. Uh, before the, uh, asking the vertex uh, requirement cut, we have uh, 10,000 events, a very clean signal that you can see. And after the inversion, uh, nothing is left. So you can see the power of this uh, rejection. So uh, then we need to reconstruct the uh, uh, kinematic of the decay. We have two neutrinos uh, present in this decay, but we have uh, two line of flights. We know the line of flight of the lambda b by joining the primary vertex to the lambda b vertex. And we know uh, the tau uh, line of flight by joining these two vertices. So uh, then we are left with the uh, equation of second degree, which we can be solved with uh, up to a twofold ambiguity. We take the average of each uh, solution and uh, we can reconstruct the momenta, the decay time, and the Q square with a 15% resolution. So uh, we can uh, now control uh, this double charm background through the reconstruction of DS and D0 exclusive peak. So uh, the charm background uh, come from uh, this uh, simple, uh, the w, virtual W decay into a C bar S pair. And this pair will materialize mostly into DS, which can be also excited, DS star, DS double star or through a decay mode. Uh, when we look at the three pion mass, we see a very clear peak here of DS into three pion exclusive decay, which has a 1% branching fraction. And all this rest here is mostly decays where the DS goes to a three pion plus something else, uh, which has a branching fraction, which is about 30 times larger than uh, the exclusive peak that you see uh, here. Uh, note also this edge here at 1.4 GV, which um, is the end of phase space for the DDK into K3 pi. Uh, so this edge here helps to control uh, the channel where the D meson is produced here. So one thing which uh, is not very well known is the relative amount of a DS, DS star, and DS double star. So uh, to know this, we look at the lambda C 3 pi mass when the 3 pi are part of this DS peak. So you see here in light blue the lambda C DS reaction. 
Then in brown, you have the lambda CDS star. And uh, this still here is a mixture of uh, lambda CDS double star and also excited lambda C uh, state combined with the DS meson. So we, we measure the, those relative rates. And if you uh, look on the right, we project the result of this fit onto the Q square variable. And you see we have a good description of all these components uh, with uh, the various components here uh, indicated. So uh, the final um, step in the analysis is to separate those DS decays, which are the larger background, as I mentioned, from tau decays. And here we are very fortunate uh, because uh, the three pi system, uh, the dynamics of this three pi uh, is very different from tau decays from DS decay. In tau, uh, you have a A1 resonance that decays to rho pi. So we have a rho peak in both pi plus pi minus mass combination. Whereas the DS decays to eta, eta prime, phi, omega, and so on. So uh, if you look here at the minimum pi pi mass, the signal in blue has a clear rho peak and the DS is completely different. And same thing for the maximum pi pi mass. So, uh, here you have, uh, in summary, the really nice feature of these three pronged tau decays. Uh, not only you have a very strong, complete suppression of the pronged background, a good kinematic reconstruction, sorry, and a powerful uh, tau uh, DS distinction. In other terms, the three pi they tell you uh, what is your, uh, their parent. So uh, with that, we can do a fit uh, in a three dimension, a bin maximum likelihood template fit to the data. The variable are the tau decay time Q square and this anti DS BDT. And uh, from that, we extract the signal yield of 349 uh, events plus or minus 40 out of a total of 4,000 events, which are dominated, as I mentioned, by DS decays. Here is a projection of the fit. If you look uh, on the BDT output here, you see uh, in red, the signal is very well separated from the orange, which is the DS uh, component, as it should be. And uh, for if you look as function of the tau decay time, uh, you see that the blue component here, which is a D plus decay, has this long tail here, which is very specific of the D plus due to its uh, long lifetime. So we can also well isolate as uh, a signal from the D plus decays. And uh, D zero decays are quite uh, suppressed uh, at the beginning by uh, isolation requirements. Five so, minutes. Yes, yeah, thank you. If now we look at the Q square projection, uh, here I show a plot on two different uh, BDT regions. At low BDT, where we have uh, basically uh, only uh, background. Oh, sorry. And at high BDT, uh, you see uh, we have a signal to noise, which is quite respectable, uh, uh, rather typical of a, a B factory, in fact. So uh, the first thing we can do is force the signal uh, to zero and to observe the increase in the chi square variation. And uh, if we do that just on the statistical point of view, we have a 7.3 sigma uh, increase. And if we include the systematic, uh, which are dominated by the shape of the template of the various background, uh, we have a 6.1 sigma difference. So this is uh, more than five. So we can claim uh, the observation of the decay lambda b to lambda c tau nu for the first time. So to be more quantitative, we need a normalization channel, and we use uh, uh, this uh, channel lambda b to lambda c 3 pi, which has the same uh, final state composition. There is a small caveat that we uh, remove out of this lambda c 3 pi events, the lambda c star pi, because we uh, require the same dynamics of the 3 pi system uh, to reduce the systematic. So here is uh, the lambda C uh, three pi uh, peak. So you see quite clean. And we have a total after suppression of this lambda C star component 
of 8,584 uh, signal events. And uh, you can see here on the right uh, that if you compare the 3 pi mass, that is the dynamic of the system uh, in the lambda b to lambda c 3 pi to the b to d star 3 pi, you have basically exactly the same distribution, which means we are uh, dominated by lambda c a1 and uh, in good agreement with the factorization. So here is a detailed list of all the systematics assessed to our measurement. There is one dominant term, uh, which I mentioned already, which is the shape of this template from a double charm for 13%. And we have various systematic around 4% that I have not have time to describe, sorry. So for a total of 16.5% systematic uncertainty. So uh, we can then measure what we call this ratio kappa, which is the ratio of branching fraction of lambda b to lambda c tau nu divided by lambda b to lambda c 3 pi. And kappa is equal to 2.46 uh, plus minus 0.27 plus minus 0.4. Uh, this ratio should be more or less the same for the d star. And uh, it was uh, found to be two in the d star. And, uh, in the standard model, uh, it should be very similar due to factorization. Now, if we use external factor like uh, the lambda b branching fraction, which has been measured, uh, we can deduce the lambda b to lambda c tau nu branching fraction, which is found to be 1.5% uh, with those errors. And uh, the standard model expectation is 1.8%. And this is in a good agreement with the standard model expectation, little bit below. And uh, if now we use, in addition, uh, the branching fraction of lambda b to lambda c mu nu, we can compute r lambda c, which is equal to 20, uh, point, uh, uh, 24 uh, with those errors and dominated, in fact, by the uh, the error coming from this branching fraction. And the star model prediction uh, is, uh, again, in good agreement, and we are one sigma uh, below uh, this uh, value. So um, our uh, result uh, place a stringent limit in some of the region of the parameter space of effective theory with only one vector, one actual uh, vector one tensor coupling, as I showed already, because um, uh, our result implies that R lambda C should be uh, below 0.4. And uh, you see here, uh, in some of these theories, we can have a ratio well above uh, this limit. So I don't have time to uh, uh, mention uh, all uh, upcoming measurements from LHCB, but stay tuned. And uh, to conclude, I would say the lambda b to lambda c tau nu has been measured for the first time with a significance of 6.1 sigma. Uh, we measure the branching fraction to be 1.5% uh, uh, with those errors and r lambda c of 0.242, uh, which is in good agreement with the standard model, uh, one sigma below. And this result can exclude uh, region of the parameter space of effective theory with vector, axial vector, and tensor coupling. So thank you very much for your attention. And I leave uh, with you with a summary of the LHCB result on um, lepton fever violation. Thank you, Guy, for this uh, very clear presentation of a complicated analysis. Are there questions from the audience? Please raise your hand. People are a bit shy. I, I have I have an immediate question when I'm looking at your R lambda C result. Does is there any hope of uh, of improving the uncertainties, or is that measurement done as far as LHCB is concerned? No, no. There is uh, many hopes to improve. The first uh, improvement uh, can come from uh, other sources. I mean, from LHCB, but uh, maybe other experiments. Or from theory, we need to improve the measurement of this branching fraction lambda b to lambda c nu nu, which is a dominant error. So the third term here 
uh, can be uh, reduced by, so the difficulty uh, is not to measure uh, lambda C and the muon. Uh, this, uh, we have uh, thousands of such events or 10,000 million of such events, but the difficulty is to, to make sure there is nothing else. Huh? This is, uh, uh, because here what we need is uh, lambda B to lambda C mu nu, and so no uh, other pions, no other photon, uh, nothing else. So this is why there is no uh, precise measurement of uh, this, uh, but there is a precise theory, so you could use a theory prediction, and then uh, this error basically will drop out. Uh, then uh, we need improvement in the second uh, term, and this is the branching fraction lambda b to lambda c 3 pi. And here there is a, it's a rather uh, simple measurement, uh, which is underway in LHCB. Uh, it has been done for run one. Uh, there is an analysis ongoing for run two, and uh, this thing I think could be. Uh, divided by 1.5, I would say. Okay, okay, so guys, I think that- uh, uh, the third uh, term, I mean, the first term is uh, just adding more statistics, yeah. and this also will be done. That's good to know. I see there's a question from uh, Aritra. Yeah, uh, am I audible, sir? Yeah. Okay, um, uh, selfish phenomenological question. Are these observables correlated? And if yes, uh, can we lay our hands on the correl exact correl correlation numbers? Uh, you mean uh, these three, uh, K, B, and uh, R lambda C? Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, they are correlated uh, in the sense that uh, you go from one to the other by uh, external input. So to get uh, B from K, you just have to multiply by a branching fraction of uh, lambda B to lambda C3 pi. Uh, we are not using uh, the same data uh, for, for the two, so uh, we don't have any correlation uh, at this level. Uh, but um, uh, I mean, uh, you know, we, the, the branching fraction measurement come from CDF for some other experiments. So there's no correlation in these two. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, from here to there, again, it's an external factor. And uh, the number is not coming from LHCB, it's coming from Delphi right now. So, uh, but what we need is better uh, external measurement to have a better precision or R lambda C. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. I th think there are no more questions. I have more, but I'll ask them within LHCB. So I don't. Uh, I think, for in the interest of time, we need to move on. Thanks again, uh, Guy. So the next speaker is uh, Sally, who will talk uh, about Electroweek and penguin decays at Bell Two. Uh, Sally, can you share your slide? Uh, yes. One second. Okay, let me just make it a bit bigger. Perfect. Okay, so hi everyone. So my name is Sally, and it is my very big pleasure today to talk about the electroweak and radiative penguin decays at Bell 2. But uh, before I talk about this, uh, I will quickly introduce you to our accelerator and detector facility. So uh, SuperKEG-B is an energy asymmetric collider that collides positrons and electrons and epsilon uh, forest resonance. And the reason for this is that the epsilon forest resonance decays to the pair of Bs and nothing else with a very high uh, probability giving us our uh, clean B sample. So this will be in this talk usually referred to as the on resonance data. In order to have a control sample for a particular uh, type of background that we have, um, uh, which is uh, E plus E minus go to the uh, pair of light quarks, uh, also known as the continuum background, uh, we do collide uh, the electrons and positrons also 60 MeV below this epsilon forest resonance. And this will be usually referred to as the off-resonance sample. 
Uh, with nano beam scheme and the upgraded rings, um, SuperCake B uh, aims to reach uh, roughly 30 times higher instantaneous luminosity uh, by increasing uh, the currents by a factor one and a half and by decreasing the vertical size of the beam by the factor 20. And of course, this comes uh, at a cost of roughly 15 times uh, higher backgrounds. But our um, Bell 2 detector, which is a, a fully hermetic detector consisting of the vertexing system, tracking chamber, calorimetry system, and the PID uh, detectors was designed in such a way uh, in, as to give the similar or even a better performance under these conditions. Uh, on the top of that, also our uh, data acquisition system and the trigger system were uh, updated in order to be able to cope with the higher uh, redact frequency and also uh, to look for uh, more low multiplicity channels. Currently, we have roughly uh, 217 res femtobarn of the data uh, on tape, uh, which is uh, a rather smaller luminosity than initially planned, uh, but we are taking the data uh, uh, with a high data taking efficiency. Uh, some of the highlights include the fact that uh, we are the most uh, luminous experiments and uh, just last December, uh, we managed to uh, integrate the highest uh, luminosity per day, and that is 2.2 inverse femtobarn of the data. All the results that uh, I will show today uh, are based on the first 63 inverse femtobarn of the on resonance data and 9 inverse femtobarn of the off resonance data. Um, next year, we do plan to have our first uh, shutdown, um, and uh, this will be done in order uh, to have an installation of the full uh, pixel detector, which is very important uh, in order to maintain a good vertex resolution with the increasing backgrounds and also to replace uh, our barrel uh, top uh, PMTs. Uh, by that time, we do want to have a data set uh, that corresponds to that uh, of the bell. And in the far future, the goal of uh, our uh, experiment is to uh, integrate at least 50 inverse uh, at the barn of the data. So uh, just to uh, quickly uh, show you uh, how the, the highlights uh, in terms of the performance with our detector, uh, this is uh, all encap encapsulated in this plot. So uh, for instance, here you can uh, see uh, that we have a good particle identification. Um, we have a high photon matching uh, efficiency. We also have a very good uh, flavor taking performance. And uh, uh, on this plot on the right, you can, uh, where you can see the, uh, the decay time, uh, so the from the measurement of the uh, D0 lifetime, uh, which was published in uh, PRL, uh, one can see uh, an improvement by a factor of two uh, with respect uh, to the previous um, uh, B factors. So now let me move on to the main part of my talk, which is the electroweak and uh, radiated penguin decays. So these are a flavor changing uh, neutral current uh, transition, uh, which uh, occur only um, at the loop level. So they are highly suppressed in the standard model. And in my talk, uh, I will talk about uh, the four uh, following uh, uh, topics, mostly B2S transitions. So first of all, I will cover the uh, B uh, to K star gamma uh, inclusive and exclusive. And then I will uh, move on to the uh, electrowing penguin decays. Uh, from there, I will show uh, B to KLL and uh, B to K nino. Of course, these decays are uh, very interesting uh, because uh, recently there has been a tension, uh, there has been tensions observed with respect to the standard model. And of course, it would be uh, they could come uh, from uh, new physics uh, scenarios. So first of all, uh, the measurement of the branching fraction uh, for uh, B two K star gamma. So this is experimentally the cleanest channel. However, uh, in the theory, uh, uh, the branching fraction uh, a prediction suffers uh, uh, from the large uncertainties due to the form factor. So the measurement of the branching fraction is just the first step before measurement of the theoretically cleaner observables, such as the CP violation asymmetry or, or the isospin asymmetry. So the torch for the best measurement uh, of these uh, quantities is coming uh, from the Bell, which analyzed the full data set and have observed uh, 3.1 uh, sigma evidence for the isospin asymmetry uh, violation, which is uh, in expectation uh, with uh, respect to the standard model. 
So the challenge uh, for the measurement uh, of these uh, quantities uh, are different. So for the ACP, this will be statistically limited, uh, but for the isospin measurement, uh, this will be dominated uh, by the, uh, the, the uh, asymmetry uh, between the charged uh, and uh, the neutral uh, production. So now uh, moving on to, uh, to the measurement of the branching correction that we did uh, at the Bell 2. So here uh, we have reconstructed uh, our K star and also our uh, high energetic uh, gamma. And uh, here the main challenge and also the analysis and the reconstruction uh, is based on uh, trying to uh, control uh, the backgrounds. And the main backgrounds uh, come uh, from the uh, continuum events where the gammas come instead uh, from pi zero and eta. Therefore, we have developed several uh, vetoes and also a BDT-based uh, uh, selection in order to suppress these. The signal uh, was extracted uh, with an unbidden maximum likelihood fit to the um, energy difference defined here. And as one can see on these uh, plots here, uh, the signal uh, uh, was uh, seen. And uh, what the branching fraction that we, uh, we have measured uh, is consistent uh, for the neutral mode uh, within one sigma and for the uh, charge mode uh, within uh, two sigma. Then moving on to the inclusive measurement uh, of the V2 excess gamma. Uh, so here the theoretical um, uh, uncertainty is not as big and the new physics scenario um, that one could quote here uh, is for instance uh, the uh, charged Higgs. So um, this uh, analysis and the first signal that we have seen here in Bell 2 uh, was uh, uh, done using an antep Untacked approach. So we have only reconstructed uh, uh, one high energy uh, uh, gamma on the signal side. And like in the uh, exclusive case, we have our uh, selection and reconstruction uh, it includes um, pi zero and uh, eta vitos as well as the BDT. In order to extract signal here, uh, we look at the uh, inclusive photon energy spectrum. And uh, we, uh, ex uh, we subtract uh, the, from there our total expected uh, backgrounds. So for the off resonance data, uh, for the continuum backgrounds, we use the off resonance data. And for the B backgrounds, uh, we get uh, the templates uh, from uh, the simulation. As you can see very clearly here, uh, we do a C and XS that is compatible with what we would expect from the B to XS uh, gamma signal. Now moving on uh, to the study of the uh, B2KLL. So uh, I think everybody knows uh, here that there is now uh, an intriguing 3.1 uh, sigma evidence for the lepton flavor universality uh, violation that was um, measured uh, by LHCb in B2SLM transitions. In particular, the, the most uh, uh, intriguing one is coming from uh, the RK, which is the measurement of the branching correction ratio between B2K mu mu and B2K EE. And so uh, in Bell 2, we first uh, want to uh, see uh, some of these um, uh, decays. And then we can go on and uh, measure uh, RK and other uh, interesting observables. So here at Bell 2, uh, for the first look at the B2KLL spectra, we have uh, looked both uh, for the electron and the muon mode. Uh, we have suppressed the background uh, using uh, uh, BDTs. And uh, the signal was extracted uh, here uh, with a 2D simultaneous maximum likelihood fit to beam constraint mass and also uh, to the uh, energy difference. And you can uh, see the projection of this uh, fit uh, both to the MBC, so the beam constraint mass here, and to the uh, energy difference here with the signal in red, combinatorial background in green, and peaking uh, background in pink. And as you can uh, see from these plots, uh, plots and also from the measurement itself, we really see uh, the first hint uh, for the B2KLL signal. So here it is uh, really uh, important to note that already with uh, five inverse uh, atobarn of the data, um, uh, Bell 2 uh, could uh, provide uh, significant independent inform information on the RK. So this is uh, really interesting uh, to watch. 
Of course, for the foreseeable future, uh, Bell 2 will be uh, statistically limited. And then in the very far future, the challenge will be to control the lepton ID systematics. So now let me move uh, on. Five minutes. Now let me move on to the uh, last topic, which is the search uh, for the B2 uh, K mu nu. So unlike in the charged lepton case, in here we do not suffer uh, from the charm loop contribution. So we have a, a cleaner standard model uh, computation of the branching fraction. And uh, in the standard model, it is predicted to be roughly 4.6 times 10 to the minus six. In the measurement that I'm going to show, uh, which was now published uh, in PRL, uh, we are measuring the standard model process uh, with the uh, dineutrino uh, mass uh, square distribution uh, shown in this plot here, uh, in this uh, red band. Of course, uh, from the beyond standard model, um, uh, a point of view, it is a nice uh, measurement to do because it is complementary to uh, those uh, where the tensions have been uh, observed. And it has a very uh, rich uh, new physics uh, landscape. So one can uh, uh, think that uh, uh, the, one could do either leptoquarks, uh, have leptoquarks, axion, or dark uh, matter candidates that could then enhance uh, the branching fraction and other observables related uh, to this uh, uh, decay. Um, uh, this decay has not been observed uh, yet, and so far the best limit had been uh, set by Babar uh, of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 5. Um, and it, uh, they have measured uh, this uh, using an exclusive uh, detect event. So in this case, one would usually reconstruct the companion B, and only after that, one would reconstruct uh, the signal B. This, however, leads to usually to quite uh, low efficiency. Since in our case, we only had a subset uh, of uh, that luminosity uh, available, um, we have decided uh, to exploit uh, a new method using a so-called an inclusive tech, uh, which is based um, on exploiting uh, the differences between the signal and the backgrounds. And in this case, we would first reconstruct uh, the signal, and only after that, we would go on and reconstruct uh, the remaining tracks uh, and clusters uh, in the event. Um, this, however, lead uh, to a higher signal efficiency, uh, but also a higher backgrounds. And so we have most of our analysis uh, is uh, done in such a way as to minimize um, the background contamination. And we do it with the series of two nested uh, BDTs. These uh, analysis strategy and BDTs are then uh, validated with our uh, control channel, uh, b 2 chapsi k and you can see uh, the plots uh, of the Data Monte Carlo um, agreement for both the BDT1 and the BDT2 uh, on this plot here. You can see an example um, of the differences between the uh, signal and the background on the plot on the right here, where our signal in red is more uh, um, spherical than continuum background, but less spherical than uh, BB bar background. So once uh, everything was validated, uh, we uh, did a build uh, in simultaneous maximum likelihood fit uh, to the uh, transverse momentum of the KN and the output of the second BDT in uh, order to extract uh, the signal strength. And as you can see on this plot here, uh, where the uh, yields uh, of the best fit uh, are projected, uh, we have uh, not observed a significant signal. So this is in the bright red, uh, but we therefore uh, set a limit. And the one that we got is uh, 4.1 times 10 to the minus five. So it is not the best, but it is uh, competitive with only 63 inverse femtobarn of the data. If one uh, would do um, try to compare uh, the performances of these different uh, tagging approaches uh, on the same luminosity, uh, one uh, would arrive uh, and see that this inclusive tag actually shows the best perform performance. Therefore, in the update of this analysis, uh, we will try to uh, extend this to the similar channels, and we will also try to uh, reduce the leading systematics. 
Uh, and uh, in the end of the day, in order to see this decay as fast as possible, uh, uh, combined analysis of inclusively and exclusively tagged events uh, is also in the pipeline. So in conclusion, I hope uh, that I have convinced you that uh, given that we have seen the first uh, signals in this decay, Bell2 is accumulating uh, uh, high quality data. Uh, the first published Bell to B uh, physics paper is actually for the search of uh, B2 uh, KNU, where we have uh, observed, uh, where we have set a competitive limit uh, only with a fraction of the previous B factory data set by employing a, no a new novel uh, tagging approach. And uh, we expect improved measurements uh, soon, given that we have already four times more. Uh, a uh, bigger data set on the tape, but we also try to improve uh, the analysis techniques. And of course, this is all very important in understanding um, the flavor anomalies that we observe. Thank you. Thank you, Sally, for that very <clears throat> clear presentation. Uh, I lost the window with the people. Are there any questions? I don't have it anymore. Ah, here you are, Chris. Thanks very much. Very nice presentation. Uh, if you go back to, to slide 10, you were showing your expectation for uh, for our K with um, five inverse atabons, I think it was. Um, yes. So at the start of the, um, of the presentation, you gave the new schedule. Uh, so, so when with this new schedule would you expect to have of this um, uh, five inverse atabons? Um. That's a good question. So, so I think I can. I don't know the answer uh, on the top of my head. It also depends a little bit um, on the on the long shutdown and when uh, it will be. But um, I guess it will be sometime after uh, twenty yeah twenty twenty four. Uh, so, so, so on, on that plot there, I, I can sort of extrapolate that line upwards. Can I? Is that is that the expectation for the next few years after after twenty twenty four? So, the the this, this uh, schedule has been updated and recently. You can uh, extrapolate it, um, but uh, there will be also a second uh, shutdown. And so, I, I have to check. I will give you an answer when maybe uh, offline. Because yeah, I cannot see it from this plot. Okay, many thanks. I see no other question. Just just a quick one on the you you mentioned the limitation from lepton ID. That's electron versus pions and uh, muon versus pions, or electrons versus muons, which would be more surprising. Uh, no, I think this is uh, so. Yes, so I think this is coming from the uh, lepton ID systematic. So this will, uh, yes, this is pions with respect to the pions. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the background from uh, KPI pi and so on. Okay. Good. Since there are no other hands raised, then uh, thanks again, Sally. And we move to Carla, who will speak about. Uh, lepton flavor non-universal measurements from LHCB. Hello, can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. You should be seeing it now, does that yes, work? Yes, that works, yes. Okay, Perfect. great. So thanks for the introduction. Indeed, it's a pleasure for me to present lepton flavor non-universal measurements from LHCB. And I should say that I will focus on this talk on, on B2SLL decays, and you've probably seen that uh, the has covered B2CL new uh, in the first talk of the session, in fact. Okay, so I um, mean, we have seen this already, but why are rare B2SLL decays? Why are we interested in these decays in particular? So these are flavor changing neutral currents, and these are sensitive to indirect effects on new physics that basically can enter uh, these loops that uh, mediate these transitions. And this can affect uh, their properties, basically. So it can be their branching fractions, angular distributions, or other things. And this actually gives us access to much larger scales uh, of new physics than direct searches, which is a, a plus. And actually, uh, something relevant in the case of uh, B2SLL is that we are testing here uh, the, the new physics couplings to third generation D quarks, uh, which, is, uh, which is something uh, not so explored. 
Okay, um, so as you know, uh, we have some intriguing deviations in this type of decays in the in the recent past. Um, we have it both in a, what we call not so clean observable. So these are, for instance, range in ratio and angular distributions that you can see here uh, have a, a pattern of the branching ratios of being lower than the standard model prediction. Uh, why for the angular distribution, the most famous one is this P5 prime observable in case that we knew that is also uh, away from the, from the standard model prediction. Now, on the other hand, we have uh, some uh, observables that are much cleaner in the standard model predictions, uh, which are what we call lepton flavor universality tests uh, that basically test uh, the proportions between uh, the same decay with different leptons in the final state. And you can see here uh, recent results from LHCB in the modes B to KLL, B0 to K star LL, and lambda B to PKLL. And you can see that uh, the three of them actually give lower results uh, than the standard model universal prediction, although with different significances. Okay, um, now how do we do interpret all of this? Uh, well, we usually uh, exploit what we call the model independent description. So this is an effective field theory. Uh, basically, you can write uh, the full uh, the full basis of four body operators uh, describing this P two SLL interaction. And here you have the operators that contribute in the standard model, which are uh, these three. And uh, then also you can have a scalar and pseudo scalar operators uh, beyond the standard model. And something interesting of these uh, operators is that they contribute differently uh, to different transitions. And also they contribute differently depending where you look in the lepton invariant mass square, which we call Q squared. So you see here you are sensitive uh, to this interference while here you are sensitive uh, to these other coefficients. Okay, now uh, what are lepton universality tests in detail themselves? So basically, uh, leptons of uh, different species, uh, we expect them to couple identically to the electroweak uh, bosons in the standard model. This is what we call lepton flavor universality. So we want to measure uh, this property. And for this, we basically look at the ratio of the same B to SLL process uh, with muons and electrons in the final state in this case. Uh, this is the, the technical uh, description if you want, because we measure this actually in a given uh, range of, uh, of Q squared. And the, the most important thing of this ratio is that it allows to cancel hadronic uncertainties that affect the single decays, but uh, that since they enter equally for muons and electrons in this ratio, uh, they cancel out and you get a very clean uh, theory prediction. Okay, so how we measure this at LHCV? Well, uh, LHCV, you, you probably are familiar with it. It's been presented already. It's a single arm forward spectrometer uh, where you have the proton-proton collisions here and we basically instrument the full forward region. So let me just point out uh, two important things for this type of measurements, uh, which is the resolution of the electromagnetic calorimeter that is used uh, to uh, reconstruct photons emitted by Bremsstrahlung from the electrons. And the capabilities, uh, the particle identification capabilities of LHCV in reconstructing electrons and, and muons with very high precision and small mis ID rates. Okay, now let's uh, let's go into detail on how we measure this lepton flavor universality test at LHCV. So in the in the standard model, we expect that these ratios are basically one. This is fine. Now experimentally, what we do is that we measure the yields of these two processes. And we, uh, we correct them from our efficiencies reconstructing and selecting these events. So the first we basically get it, we get it from mass fits to the invariant mass distributions of these decays in data, while the second uh, we get from simulations or calibration samples. Something important uh, at LHCV that we do is that we exploit uh, the, the well-tested lepton universality Jepsi mode. So this is the same decay as the rare B to SLL, but with a JEPSA in the final state. So now you have uh, a B adron going to another adron and a JEPSA, and this JEPSA can go either to two muons or two electrons. And this has been measured uh, very precisely to happen in equal rates. So basically, if you look at this ratio of branching ratios, this should be one. And this actually provides a stringent cross-check of the absolute efficiencies uh, that we, that we, with what we measure this decays. Moreover, this allows us to build uh, what we call a double ratio, which allows to cancel uh, largely systematic effects from the reconstruction of different final states. Uh, so this double ratio basically what means is that uh, we don't measure uh, the muon yield by itself, but we measure it normalized to the JEPSI mode. 
And we do the same for the electron mode. We measure the rare mode normalized with the Jepsi mode. And then we do exactly the same uh, for the efficiencies uh, in such a way that uh, controlling this ratio of electron efficiencies is, uh, is much better than controlling the absolute ratio of electrons to moons. Okay, why, why do we actually need to do this? Well, this is basically because electrons and muons are very different at LHCb. And there are mainly two, two reasons for this. On one hand, we have the, the response of the hardware trigger. So uh, the problem is that uh, the LHC, uh, the, the equal occupancy is very large in these proton-proton collisions. So we basically need to require quite tight thresholds in the trigger to reconstruct them. Uh, well, this is not the case for MEONS. So to give you an example, you can see here the thresholds we used in this uh, hardware trigger for electrons and MEONS uh, in 2016 and 2012. And you can see that they are really different. So this basically is much more efficient selecting the MEON mode than the electron one. On the other hand, uh, electrons also interact very differently with the material as they traverse LHCb. Uh, in particular, they emit much more Bremsstrahlung. We have a recovery procedure in place, which basically consists in extrapolating the direction of the tracks before the magnetic, uh, before the magnet, and uh, check whether there is a calorimeter photon matching this trajectory. If we find any, we basically add this energy to the track momentum to get the full energy of the electron. This works well, but of course it has uh, some penalties. So on one hand, we can, we can miss some of these photons and it can also happen that we add some ones that are just matching this trajectory randomly, uh, but they're not coming from the electron. And on the other hand, the equal resolution at uh, these energies is worse than the tracking. So uh, this, has, uh, yeah, this has a penalty on the resolution with, 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 with what we reconstruct the electron moment. Okay, uh, now that, uh, that I've covered the main experimental issues, let me move to, to the actual most recent results from LHCb. So the first of them is the update of RK with the full LHCb data. And uh, first, let me start with the cross checks we performed with the JEPSI and SAP2S modes. So uh, you see here the value we obtained for our JEPSI. So this is the single ratio of the JEPSI modes in the muon and the electron final state. You see that this is uh, very well compatible with one, which is the expectation. And this actually shows that we have actually even a good control of the absolute electron and muon efficiencies. You see here uh, the two final states uh, where, the, where what we use is that we constrain the invariant mass of the two muons or the two electrons to be that of the known uh, Jepsi mass. And this allows us to have a, a good mass resolution here, even for electrons, although you see a small degradation already. We don't measure Jepsi only in an absolute term, but we also check how it varies as a function of relevant kinematic variables to see if there's any effect on, on any kinematics. And we see that basically all the checks we perform will turn out a flat distribution, uh, which makes us confident that the efficiencies are under control in the full kinematic range. And finally, we also measure a double ratio uh, for ARP side to S. So this is the same as we do uh, for the RK double ratio itself, but in this case, normalizing uh, side to S decays to JEP side ones. And you see again that in this case, uh, we get a result that is uh, very well compatible uh, with the universal standard model expectation. Okay, uh, let me also cover a bit uh, the systematic uncertainties because uh, this, is, this is quite relevant also to be able to get the precise measurements we get in the end and to be sure that we control all the experimental effects that affect these measurements. So the, the most relevant ones are basically these two and the, the first one comes from the FIT model. So the, the shapes we use to describe the signal and band grounds in this decays, in particular in the electron mode. And the second one comes from the, from the size of the calibration samples that we use uh, to correct the, the simulations and extract some of the efficiencies. Then uh, the, the technique itself of uh, which uh, method exactly we use for this calibration has a very small impact. And uh, any other effects that we have studied, for instance, uh, how the Q square distribution changes uh, with different physical models or the resolution difference in data in Monte Carlo have a totally negligible effect. And I want also to emphasize that uh, the fact that uh, these systematics are so small, in, in particular for the calibration of the simulation, is basically because this double ratio strategy makes this, uh, the effect of these corrections on the simulation rather small. So to give you just a feeling, this effect on RK is just about 3%, uh, 
while on the single ratio RGEP psi is, uh, is of 20%. So you see the, very much the power of the double ratio in canceling all these effects. Okay, now moving to the actual results. This is the measurement uh, in, the, in, the, in this low Q square region with the full LHCV data set, which is basically twice uh, larger the hadron sample than the previous result. And uh, yeah, we get RK from the simultaneous fit of the muon mode and the electron mode. You can see that the electron mode is much more challenging uh, due to this degraded mass resolution, which makes it uh, basically be affected by, by larger and backgrounds. But these are uh, very well under control in the end, and we are able to characterize very precisely this distribution. So putting all this together, uh, we obtain this value for RK, uh, which is the most precise uh, value of RK to date. And it's, uh, it's consistent with the standard model only at the level of 0.1%. Uh, so uh, this is basically a 3.1 sigma deviation from universality, which is the first evidence for the breaking of lepton universality in this b 2 sll case. Now, moving on uh, to even more recent results, uh, we basically have uh, performed also a measurement of RK and RK star with neutral kaons. So this is basically a measurement of the isospin partners of the, of the previous result and our previous RK star results using the decay of B0 to K short uh, to leptons or B plus to K star plus, uh, then going to K short and apion and also to leptons. Uh, this decays, as you have seen, were explored by Bell and Bavar so far, but not by LHCV, since this is more challenging for us. Uh, but still, there has not been an unambiguous observation of the electron modes uh, before. So uh, basically, these measurements follow the very same strategy as, as RK. There are just some particularities uh, that affect the reconstruction of these uh, neutral kaons. So we reconstruct this in the pi pi final state. And we actually reconstruct them from what we call both long and downstream tracks, uh, because basically uh, these k shores can fly much more than the size of our vertex detector. Uh, so if the, these kaons decay outside the vertex detector, we are only able to reconstruct the tracks in the downstream uh, tracking stations. And this is what we call a downstream track. Uh, but yes, we still are able to use this for the physics measurement. This has a bit of a lower resolution, but still are good enough for our measurements. So we use uh, both types of tracks. Still, as you will see, the yields are, are smaller because still we are not able to reconstruct all, all the k shores. And for more experimental details, I, I, I point you to the CERN seminar where this was explained in very much detail. So let me move uh, to the results. Uh, we perform separate feeds to the B0 and the B plus decays in this case, but a simultaneous feed to muons and electrons in the same mode. So you see on the left the results for the B0 decay, uh, which again show a much uh, more uh, complicated structure in the electron case with more backgrounds, but still. Uh, they are under control and, and well modeled. And you see the same on the right for the B plus uh, decay. So with this, uh, we measure these values of RK short and RK star plus, which again are uh, lower than the standard model expectation, although in this case, they are, they are compatible within the statistical uncertainties. These are the most precise results, and yeah, they are consistent at the level of 1.5 and 1.4 sigma with the standard model predictions. From this, uh, we are actually uh, observing for the first time unambiguously the electron mode uh, with a clear significance. Um, we also include uh, electron MIS-ID backgrounds in these feeds. So you can see here, although they are very small, they are precisely controlled there. And we are able to extract uh, the differential measurement of the branching fraction for this uh, Q square beams also for this decays, uh, as you can see here, which are at the level of uh, 10 to the minus eight each. Okay, uh, let me just uh, briefly uh, cover what will happen in the future. So as you probably know, we will start taking data again at the LHC this year. And this is what we call run three of, uh, of LHCV. Um, we will collect a sample of around 23 inverse femtobar or maybe even more. So we will be able uh, to reduce significantly the uncertainty on RK, RK star, and actually measure this uh, lepton universality test also in other quantities and in other decay modes. Um, here on the right, as a summary, you see what, uh, what uh, will be the potential constraints on the Wilson coefficients uh, from these measurements. 
So you see here in the full circles what will happen after this run three, but actually we plan to collect even more data in the future on the 2030s uh, with the aim of uh, collecting a total of 300 inverse femtobar. And this is, uh, that's the difference you see. Sorry, the, the full one is the, the final upgrade while the dash one is what happens after run three. But you see that basically if, uh, if there's new physics uh, with the scenarios that are currently preferred, we will be able to really separate that from the standard model expectation, which is here at zero. So this brings me to my summary. I hope I've convinced you that uh, RARE V2 SLLDKs provide a stringent test to test new physics. And we have some very interesting results uh, hinting at uh, the breaking of lepton flavored universality in these V2 SLLDKs in the RK and RK star uh, decays in particular. But stay tuned because uh, we will have even more results soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that nice overview of exciting results. Uh, again, I need to, yes, I need to check if there are any questions on uh, to Carla. Yes, Sarab. Uh, yes. Um... Can you go to slide 15? Uh, sure. Uh, Here? Yes, yes. So uh, I was just wondering, uh, this R pi is B2 pi mu over E or something else? Because I haven't seen uh, the CB result on, uh, uh, in the table, sorry. I was on slide number 15. Sorry, can you, can you say can that Can you hear again? me well? Uh, yeah, slide yes. number 15 on the table. Ah, slide 15. Okay, yeah. Ah, you were asking about air pipe? Yes. So what, what yeah. is that ratio? Yeah, sorry, I didn't have the time to explain this. This would be basically the ratio of uh, B to pi LL. So this would be the B to D transition, uh, which we haven't yet been able to, to test with the, with oh, the Okay, so this state. is the best on uh, simulation. Okay, okay, got it. Yeah. yeah, this is based okay. on the expectations. I mean, for this decay, we have observed the muon mode. So B to pi mu mu has been observed at LHCB, but not okay. the electron mode so far. But this is the expectation from, yeah, in the simulation okay, I got it. I, and what okay, we I see in other just... modes. Got it, got it, got it. Thanks. Thanks. If there are no other question, then thanks again, Carla. And I think you're, well, you. you're next actually. <laughs> yes. So this is same results, but this time from Bell. <laughs> um, yeah, but I will be uh, presenting something different. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. <laughs> We're looking forward to that. Yes. <laughs> okay, I see your slides. They're not full screen yet. Uh, I'm not full screen, just a second. Okay, can you everything all set? Okay, uh, Saleh, start? Yes, please. Okay, okay. So um, I will be presenting about uh, the searches of lepton flavor universality evaluation. Basically, I will be focusing more on the lepton flavor violating results in Pell. Okay, so um, as I said, so I will be mostly discussing slightly different. Uh, I will be uh, discussing the searches uh, for B two K start out of that is the first search and also lepton flavor volating decay uh, B two L tau and there will be also first report on the lepton flavor volating results on upsilon one S and also uh, the improved measurement on tau going to uh, mu gamma and e gamma. Okay, so just a a, a quick um, a quick overview of our experiment. So the bell uh, which was uh, the earlier setup. Uh, of Bell 2. So it was located uh, at the interaction region of electron positron colli uh, collider, which was KKB. And uh, it had a successful operational period and it recorded uh, a sample of about one atoban inverse. And uh, most of the data at Bell was recorded at Upsilon 4S resonance. And uh, however, we have collected uh, data at several Upsilon resonances. And I will be talking about these data sets that is used in analysis. Uh, so basically, um, uh, at uh, E plus E minus collision at epsilon 4s, the similar cross section of tau plus tau minus is also there. 
and uh, also um, CC bar event. So uh, it it just not only produce uh, a large sample of uh, B meson, but also D mesons and tau leptons. Okay, so uh, moving to lepton flavor universality. So uh, the three flavors of the charged leptons are supposedly same in all, uh, many aspects apart from their mass differences and the electroweak coupling uh, of the gauge boson to the lepton is expected to be independent of flavor. So this has been broadly covered in the previous talks. And uh, the bottom line is that uh, uh, there has been possible deviation from lepton flavor universality has been seen. And this one example I quoted uh, uh, from the charge current B decay and where RD and RD star shows uh, deviations. Earlier it was 3.8 sigma, but with recent Bell analysis, it moved down to 3.1 sigma. And uh, similarly also discussed uh, in a previous talk uh, about RK and RK stars. And uh, 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 these are the blue points are the Bell measurement and uh, the magenta is LHCB and which shows the largest deviation and uh, 3.1 sigma and uh, uh, around uh, more than two sigma in RK and RK star respectively. So, um, so basically this lepton flavor universality violation mostly has been seen uh, in electron and muon. So it will be more interesting if we see and observe the decay B2K star tau tau since uh, uh, there is a third generation of lepton is involved. So it, it may provide additional sensitivity to the new physics. Uh, the branching fraction is uh, of the same order, um, 10 power minus 7. However, the presence of new physics may enhance this uh, by uh, up to three orders and can bring uh, up this branching fraction up to order of 10 power minus 4. So as you might have noticed, uh, this decay is experimentally very challenging as there uh, may be presence of at least two neutrino in the final state and the reconstruction of these decays would be very difficult. So uh, previous to that, Babar has searched for B to K tau tau, and uh, the sample used was uh, 424 femtobar inverse, and the B meson, uh, the companion B meson has been reconstructed in the hadronic uh, decay modes. Um, and then uh, the taus are uh, reconstructed in electronic final states. So upper limit on the branching fraction of B to K tau tau has been uh, derived uh, of the order of uh, 2 into 10 power minus 3. However, there has been no search on uh, B going to K star tau tau uh, so far. So uh, this decay has been searched in Bell. And uh, uh, so uh, from Upsilon 4s, uh, a pair of B meson uh, uh, is obtained. And then uh, the companion B meson is reconstructed in uh, hadronic final state to know the pore momenta of uh, the companion B meson precisely and such that we can get the pore momenta of the signal B meson. And then uh, uh, B2K star tau tau is reconstructed and we just focused on uh, one prong tau decays. So uh, there will be total four charge track required, uh, two coming from the K star and two coming from the tau ones and a net charge in the event to be uh, equal to zero. And then uh, requirement on the mass of the uh, di tau on pair and as well as the mass of uh, two lepton pair is uh, the requirement is imposed. Uh, notice that uh, we know the moment, uh, four moment of B meson from the, knowing the, uh, the companion B meson. Okay, so then uh, the number of signal uh, candidates uh, are extracted by fitting the distribution on the extra calorimeter energy, energy, which is called E ECL extra. So this is basically the total energy of the neutral cluster detected in the, uh, the calorimeter, uh, which is not associated with either of the signal B decay or the tag B decay. So um, overall, the signal efficiency is around 1.2 pounds five. Notice that here is, uh, this accounts for um, also a tagging efficiency, which is about 0.24%. Uh, the signal um, is consistent with um, uh, no signal hypothesis minus 4.9 plus minus 6.0 and the upper limit is uh, found to be around 2.0 and 10 power minus 3. So this is the first experimental limit on B2K star tau tau and hopefully uh, this will be discovered uh, in Bell 2. Moving on, um, 
to lepton flavor uh, violation. So in several new physics model, lepton flavor violation may arise together with lepton flavor universality violation. So this might be interesting to look into lepton flavor violating modes. So this has been searched uh, B2K star mu e and uh, B2K mu e uh, in Bell recently. Uh, so here the, uh, the first and second generation of leptons are involved. And recently uh, the lepton flavor violating B decays with tau final state uh, is searched at Bell. And uh, this may occur uh, via neutrino mixing uh, diagram, uh, but the rate is, uh, uh, highly suppressed of the order of power 40, which is below any uh, the current and future experimental sensitivity. However, uh, new physics can enhance um, the presence of lepton flavor violating decay, and it can go as high as 10 power minus 9. So earlier uh, limits comes from uh, Clio, Babar, and LHCB, um, and hence it is uh, uh, this uh, search is motivated at well with full data sample. So here also. Um, uh, the other B meson, the companion B meson, is um, reconstructed in hadronic final state. So, uh, in an event, again, uh, just to, just a reminder. So, we have just two B mesons. So, one is the tag, and the other is the signal. So, once uh, the tag side is fully known, uh, uh, then we can know the four momenta of the signal B meson, and we just reconstruct one lepton, uh, not the tau, and uh, we can know the four momenta of the tau on. Uh, tau. So um, uh, uh, then we can get the invariant mass of the tau, and this uh, uh, missing mass basically is the tau mass. And uh, uh, the signal yields are extracted by performing an unbent maximum likelihood fit to this missing mass distribution. So before going to the uh, signal fit, so we can uh, we can uh, have b going to d star pi as a good control sample. So basically, same. Uh, same analysis method is applied can be applied here, and instead of lepton, we can just reconstruct pi on, and uh, the other event selection uh, remain exactly same. So uh, this missing mass would peak around uh, d and d star, and uh, this is also useful to determine correction factors for b to l tau uh, case. Here the signal efficiency is around uh, 0.1 percent. And uh, uh, we validated uh, by uh, reducing the branching fraction and comparing it to the PDG value, which is found uh, to be very consistent. So uh, this is the result for B going to mu tau and uh, B going to E tau. And the signal efficiency is around uh, 1.1 into 10 power minus 3 in both the uh, decay modes. And here, the tagging efficiency is also taken into account. And um, the upper limit is found for mu tau uh, and e tau uh, roughly around same 1.5 and for e tau, this is the uh, most stringent limit. Okay, moving to uh, lepton flavor decays of upsilon 1s. So uh, we searched for um, two body lepton flavor violating decay, that is upsilon 1s going to LL prime. And these two lepton can be any of the lepton that is electron muon tau on. And we also search for three body radiative, radiative lepton flavor violating, violating decay. So uh, there's no search on the three body uh, radiative LFB. And uh, also there is no result on uh, upsilon one is going to E mu and E tau. So these are the first results. So why radiative LFB? Because uh, this allowed to probe the operators uh, which are not accessible in the two body decay. So here uh, we do not directly look into the upsilon 1s uh, data sample. Uh, so however, we looked into the upsilon 1s uh, decaying to, sorry, upsilon 2s decaying to upsilon 1s uh, with a di pi on, and then upsilon 1s going to uh, LL prime or gamma LL prime uh, to do this because it is more trigger efficient and better handling of the QED background. So uh, these decay modes are reconstructed and the tau is reconstructed uh, in uh, these modes, um, uh, three pions and uh, electron in case when, when there is a muon and muon when there is a, uh, sorry, electron here, there is a typo here. So to validate uh, and calibrate the analysis, um, uh, upsilon one is going to EE and mu mu is also reconstructed. And uh, to select event, uh, we uh, fit uh, the required mass. Uh, that is uh, the type ion recoiling against upsilon 2s. Okay. Five uh, minutes. Yes. 
Thanks. So uh, the signal is extracted in this uh, delta m, which is uh, m pi pi e mu over subtracted with m e mu mass. And uh, here are the fit. And uh, no signal is observed for mu e as well as mu tau and e tau. And we derive an upper limit around uh, of the order of 10 power minus 7 in all the three modes. And uh, for radiative LFB, uh, similarly, the uh, signal is extracted from delta m fit. And uh, uh, the upper limit is derived for uh, gamma mu e around 10 power minus 7, and for mu tau and e tau of the order of 10 power minus 6. OK, so uh, the last topic is um, uh, searches for uh, tau going to uh, L gamma. So this is, again, um, a very small probability of this decay to happen of the order of 10 power minus 40 with this neutrino oscillation diagram. and. Uh, However, this can again go up uh, with the new physics, uh, with the presence of new physics as high as 10 power minus 9. And these are the, uh, the experimental status. And uh, these are basically uh, of the order of 10 power minus 8 in both Bell and Babar. So uh, for this time, uh, uh, the earlier we had uh, search for this decay with 535 femtobar inverse, but now we are looking for this decay with around 1 atobar inverse. So almost doubling uh, the sample size. And uh, the selection uh, is improved and introduced uh, on some new variables. And uh, here, also similar to uh, uh, B-Meson uh, analysis. So here, also E plus E minus going to tau plus tau minus. So one side is uh, reconstructed in a single prong tau decay. And the signal side is we have uh, uh, one lepton and one photon. And the background can also come from uh, tau going to L nu nu and ISR uh, photon uh, or from the beam background and E plus E minus going to um, nu mu or E and combining with uh, the ISR photon or the beam background photon. So I would, uh, the new variables of the new variables. So one um, variable that I wanted to talk about that uh, this particular where uh, variable where uh, the tau, uh, uh, this is the uh, angle between tau uh, in the tag side and uh, the lepton uh, in the signal side. So this, uh, if this, uh, uh, if the uh, signal is re reconstructed properly, then it should be uh, the angle between uh, the tag side tau and the uh, the lepton. So uh, basically, this should be uh, mostly in the range of zero to one for the signal, and for background, it can uh, be out of range. And uh, yeah, so uh, variables to extract is uh, MBC, which is basically uh, uh, the energy uh, center of mass energy, which is uh, known from the uh, uh, beam uh, energies and the momentum of the lepton and gamma. Similarly, the delta is variable is defined and the two dimensional fit is uh, done to extract signal for uh, tau to mu gamma and e gamma in MBC and delta E. So basically, the reconstruction efficiency is around 3.7% and 2.9%. And uh, no signal has been observed. And the upper limit is derived to be order of uh, 4.2 into the power 8 and 5.6 into the power 8. So this brings to my summary. So recent measurement of uh, this lepton flavor volating ratios, sorry, lepton flavor universality ratios in BDK hint at the presence of new physics. And uh, uh, testing LFU ratio with case out out tau would be very interesting. However, the search is on for this decay. And uh, uh, yeah, so in many new physics model, uh, lepton flavor universality violation may arise together with lepton flavor violation. So lepton flavor violating decays uh, searches is also very important. So uh, B to L tau, uh, particularly with the tau in the final state is searched. And also um, similarly, uh, lepton flavor violating decay in other um, like upsilon 1s is also searched. And we also provided an improved limit on uh, tau to mu gamma and e gamma. So that's all from my side. Thanks. Thank you very much. That's an interesting set of results from, uh, from Bell. Uh, we have a question from Aritra. Yeah, hi, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, so it's a pretty naive question, actually. First of all, it's great to see that you guys are working towards K and K star tau tau, DKs from B. It is, it indeed is exciting. 
Uh, my question is that, uh, I mean, apart from phase-based suppression in a two-town fi final state in a neutral decay, um, is there any experimental difficulty in, in you know, um, identifying a two-town final state in, in such decays? Because uh, always we, the, the, the pattern goes that it's mu mu to E for neutral current and tau nu to um, whatever e, e nu or mu nu uh, for, for charge current. So is that just due to the phase space suppression factor or are there further experimental difficulties for that? Uh, sorry, phase space suppression would bring down uh... You are saying the experimental difficulty in the B2K tau tau reconstruction? Yeah, in, 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 in tau tau final states in neutral current decays in general. Yeah, so as I mentioned, so there are, uh, um, I mean, when tau decays, or at least there will be one neutrino uh, if we just consider tau to uh, pi nu tau. So at least two, two tau one will give at minimum two neutrinos. So handling two neutrinos would be, um, would be challenging. And uh, mostly we deal with tagging the other beam meson. So this, this method seems easy, but it, it also costs in the efficiency. So uh, because uh, there will be a reconstruction efficiency of the, uh, uh, the BDKs are also involved. So, and there's a limited number of channels we can see. However, it is at, uh, of the 500 decay modes. But the, uh, as you saw, uh, so this also brings down the number by 0.24 percent. So, um, however, uh, uh, we can also uh, we can also reconstruct with other tagging methods like semi-leptonic tagging or uh, more inclusive tagging. But mm -hmm. it is always difficult to handle neutrinos uh, in the final state in any experiment. I would say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And then we have a question from Guy. Yes. Uh... Uh, you mentioned several channels, but you did not mention uh, K mu tau, which is uh, maybe a little bit easier experimentally, or maybe I missed it. Yes, and the search is on for that, so stay tuned. Yes, that's what I can. Because <laughs> uh, this one is, uh, I think, quite interesting. In, uh, yes, y yes, it is indeed very interesting, and uh, uh, hopefully there will be. Uh, Something else. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Th thank you. I have a, another question. What is what are the longer term prospects for for these things where where you output a limit? So, should we then just wait for Bell two, or will there be combined analysis trying to exploit the joint data set of Bell and Bell two? Yes, so there are now increasing number of efforts on the combined analysis, and that will be more promising scenario. So uh, yes, as you said, so we are mostly uh, having increased number of now uh, combined analysis. So that will become more uh, more frequent in future. <laughs> yeah, that that's that's good to hear. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So. <clears throat> Thanks again for this uh, presentation on Bell. And now we have two theory presentation. The first is by Ipsita Ray on complex Wilson coefficients. Hello. Hello. Yeah, I'm audible. Yeah, you're yeah. a bit faint. And you will need to share your slides as well. If you can. Yeah, that works. Okay, can you try to speak again? Hello? Yeah, so tr try to increase your gain if you can. If not, I'll just increase the volume on my side. Is it visible now? Oh, yeah, it's good. Okay. So, First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present our work, which is based on this paper. And it is presented on behalf of our group at IDG. So you can check our group details on this web page. Now, as the title suggests, the reason why the B2SLL transitions are so fascinating is that they are 
look suppressed within the standard model and those are potential probes of physics at higher energy scales and over the years deviations have been observed in few of the angular observables like p5 prime and also in the theoretically clean ratios like rk and rk star from their respective standard model predictions and it has also been mentioned in the previous talks so we follow a model independent effective field theory approach where the effective Hamiltonian is given like this and the new physics effects are dumped into the various wells and coefficients. So this is the operator basis where O1 to O6 are the four quark operators. O7 and O7 prime are the photon dipole operators. O8, O8 prime are the chromomagnetic operators and the rest are the semi leptonic operators. Okay, regarding the experimental inputs, the exclusive B2S transitions comprise of B2K LL, B2K star LL, BS2 phi LL, BS2 mu mu, and also the other radiative modes like B2K star gamma and BS2 phi gamma. Now there has been a significant advance on the experimental front, and we have measurements on the differential branching fractions, axis spin asymmetries, and the angular observables for this different types of transitions from the various experimental collaborations. And we have considered this observables in our analysis amounting to over 200 observables. So when we have a vector meson in the final state, the decay distribution can be described by the three angles and the lepton momentum transfer variable Q squared. So from a from the averaged decay distribution, we can extract the CP averaged observables like FL, S3, etc. And from a difference of the decay widths of the direct and charge conjugated modes, the CP asymmetric observables can be extracted. Another set of observables, which are known as optimized observables, are defined as the ratios of this CP averaged observables. And these are uh, formed to reduce the theoretical uncertainties. Similarly, when you have pseudo scalar meson in the final state, the decay distribution is described in terms of the angle theta and Q squared. Experimentally, we have measurements of this FH and AFP, where AFP is the forward backward asymmetry of the dielectron system. Now, in our analysis, we have considered complex new physics Wilson coefficients in this nine operators. And we have defined three data sets. So in 2016, LACV has given the measurements for the angular observables in B2 K star mu plus mu minus using both the moments analysis and from an unbind maximum likelihood analysis. Whereas in 2020, LACV has given the measurements only based on likelihood analysis. And there are no measurements on the asymmetric observables in 2020. So the data set which we call as the likelihood LSB 2020 has asymmetric observables only in the BS2 phi mu plus mu minus mode. So we employ the frequentist statistical minimization technique, optimizing a chi-square statistic. And in the post process for each fit, we obtain the fit quality using p-value and also find the outliers. Now, when we are talking about new physics, is the aim to find out the best possible combinations of the Wilson coefficients, which is capable of explaining the present data. Now, we employ noble model selection procedures like the Akaike's information criterion and cross validation, which we'll discuss a bit later. Now, considering this nine operators, we can have various scenarios where the Wilson coefficients are taken to be either all real or all complex, thus amounting to total 1022 combinations. And we need to select the best models out of this all potential models. To start with, we first check if each of the one operator scenario can accommodate the present data in the three data sets. So we see that for the likelihood 2020 data set, only the operator O9 can give an appreciable p-value. 
whereas in all the other one operator scenarios of p values are approximately zero and comparatively we see that the one operator scenarios fit to the moment data set well we define three fit scenarios so the first one comprises of the likelihood 2020 data set where we have only the cp asymmetric observables in bs25 mu plus mu minus in the second data set we drop the cp asymmetric observables in bs25 mu plus mu minus so this data set doesn't contain any of the asymmetric observables and in the third one we add the cp asymmetric observables in b2k star mu plus mu minus from likelihood 2016 data set on top of the likelihood 2020 data set now, interestingly, we see that in all the three fit scenarios, we get large imaginary contributions of delta C9 and with different relative signs. Here we show the one minus CL plots for real and imaginary delta C9. So we see that the solution for real delta C9 is consistent in all the three fit scenarios, whereas the imaginary delta C9 shows some interesting features. So when we have the CP asymmetric observables in both B2 K star mu plus mu minus and B S2 phi mu plus mu minus, we see that a negative solution is preferred as shown by the red curve. On dropping the CP asymmetric observables in B2 K star mu plus mu minus, we see a fine flip. That is, we get a positive solution for imaginary delta C9. Again, when we drop all the CP asymmetric observables from our data set, we see a negative contribution, though positive solution is also preferred. We will explain these observations in a while. To see which observables are responsible for the large imaginary delta C9 contribution, we show the variations of some of the CP averaged and optimized observables with imaginary delta C9 for allowed values of real delta C9 at 68% confidence level. Here, the gray bands represent the experimental one sigma error bands. And these four plots clearly show that we require large imaginary contributions of delta C9 to explain this experimental observations within their one sigma error bands. Now to understand the impact of the CP asymmetric observables on our fits, we study the variations of the asymmetric observables with imaginary delta C9 for the best fit value of real delta C9. It is shown that in the BS25 mu plus mu minus mode, the asymmetric observable A8 uh, prefers positive solution for imaginary delta C9 as shown by the upper two plots. Whereas in B2 K star mu plus mu minus modes, the asymmetric observable A8 prefer negative solutions. Another thing is that the experimental data on A8 from the B2 K star mu plus mu minus is more precise than that of the BS25 mu plus mu minus mode. So when we have the CP asymmetric observables in both the BS25 mu plus mu minus and B2K star mu plus mu minus, the dominant role is played by the B2K star mu plus minus asymmetric observable, and we get a negative solution for imaginary delta C9. On dropping the B2K star mu plus minus asymmetric observables, we get a positive solution, as can be clearly seen from these plots. We have also studied the interesting scenario of delta C9 equal to minus delta C10 as appears in certain model dependent analysis. So here we see that in the moments data set 2016, we get a favorable solution of this scenario as compared to the likelihood data sets as seen by the respective P values. Okay. So now with the idea that only the operator O9 can explain the present likelihood 2020 data set, it is very important to look for other combinations of these operators. So this calls for the role of model selection. Here we have shown 
three plots. In the first plot, we have a model with fewer parameters, and we try to fit the data points with a straight line curve. Clearly, we see that it leads to a poor fit, and the differences between the data points and the theory is also large, thus leading to high bias. Next, if we see the third plot, we have a model which has larger number of parameters. We see that this model clearly fits the available data very well, but it suffers from the problem of overfitting. And if we want to give predictions for a new data point using this model, we will have very poor predictions, thus the predictive error will be more and leading to high variance. So this tells us that we should have a model with the optimum number of parameters, just right to minimize the bias and variance, and it's given by the middle plot. So the problem of model selection just boils down to selecting a model with the optimum number of parameters. As can be seen from this plot. Five minutes. Okay, thank you. As can be seen from this plot, when we increase the model complexity, that is, we introduce more parameters into our model, the bias decreases because, as we have seen in the earlier plot, that it can explain the training data well. But the variance increases because its predictive power decreases. So in between these two, there is the optimum model, which has just the right bias and variance. And on both sides, we see that the total predictive power increases. Here we employ two criteria. One is Zakaki's information criterion, which depends on the maximum likelihood estimate. N is the sample size and K is the number of parameters. So the best model has the minimum AICC and the various models are ranked in increasing orders of delta AICC. So we clearly see that when we have large number of parameters in our model, the AICC value will be large and the chances of it being the best model decreases. Apart from having a model with optimum number of parameters, we also want a model with better predictive powers. That's why we go for the cross validation. So the idea is that one of the data points is left out and rest of the sample is optimized for a particular model. And that fit result is used to find the predicted squared error for the left out data points. This process is repeated for all the data points and the mean squared error is calculated for the model. Here we have taken a conservative approach and select those models with delta AICC less than equal to six and MSC value less than 1.5. We see that our best model, model number 585, is a three-operator three scenario. And also the operator with complex uh, delta C9 is also selected in our model selection procedure. Here we have given the predictions of Archistar and P5 prime. So we see that our best model can explain all the experimental observables except the Archistar lobin. So to conclude, we see that uh, in the present with the present data set, O9 is the only one operator scenario with both real and complex Wilson coefficients that can explain the present data. And in all the other one operator scenarios, we have very poor quality fits with p values approximately zero. And O9 with complex Wilson coefficient, though it's not the best model, but it's selected in the selection criterion. And some other two, three, and four operator scenarios are also selected. And all of this contain O9 with both real or complex Wilson coefficient as one of the operators. Thank you. Thank you. That's an interesting presentation on uh, on what we expect to see with complex Wilson coefficients. Are there any questions? Ah, there's one from Carla. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the talk. 
Um, yeah, this is probably a very naive question, but I think if I understood correctly, you are not using um, the, mes the direct measurements of CP asymmetries in the various p 2 SLL modes. And I was wondering if this is because with the information on the angular analysis, uh, you don't expect to gain much or, or what's the reason for that? Uh, sorry, we are using the supersymmetric observables in B2 Kester mu plus mu minus mode from LACB 2016 data. So this is in the angular analysis, right? So the, the angular observables that are sensitive to CP violation, but we have also measurements of direct CP violation in this mode. So just no, comparing. Using, no. Exactly. And, and why, why is that? Uh, like in B2SLL process, the direct CP asymmetry is uh, very suppressed, like of the order of 10 to the power minus 3. Sure, and, and doesn't that give you constraints on the imaginary part of the Wilson coefficients? Like uh, if uh, these are enhanced, we should see also larger CP violation or, or you don't expect that? Yeah, if we consider that there may be constraints on the imaginary parts. Okay, well, I think, I don't know, I'm not sure I understood the issue, but I think it would be interesting to see the effect of these observables as well. Thanks. Yeah. And there's a question from Aritra. We can't hear you. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I forgot to unmute. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a clarification to Carlos' question. Um, yes, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, and we will be we are uh, anal analysis is currently ongoing, and uh, we plan to include uh, the direct CP asymmetries in that. And yes, uh, we are hopeful that it would produce further constraints on the imaginary part of delta C nine. Okay, thanks very much for the clarification. Yeah, I had a follow-up question on that. The, is there any measurement from LHCB that we presumably could easily produce that uh, that would be a silver bullet for for you? Like, I don't know if we if we measured R K separately for K plus and K minus, or or something like that that we could do but aren't presently not doing. I don't. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, can you please repeat the question? I would. I, I wanted to know if there's any particular measurement from LHCB you think that would be useful for your for your fit that we're presently not measuring. Mm. Particular measurement, uh, like giving predictions or what? Okay, may may maybe we should take that offline. I thought it was a <clears throat> uh, it it would allow for a short answer. Um, I'll I'll contact you offline. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think we should con continue. Uh, uh, continue or will be late for the, for the coffee break. Uh, there's one more presentation, so thank you again for this uh, this presentation, Ipsita. And the next is Aritra. You have uh, <clears throat> ah yes, something on B2U decays. Yeah, thank you. Just let me share my screen. Uh, yeah, so is it visible, my yes, slide? Perfect, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak here tonight because I'm in India right now. Um, so, uh, I'll be talking about two of my recent works. 
uh, which has been done as a part of the CSB IITG collaboration. Uh, we are a small and young group uh, at IIT Guwahati, India. These works were done in collaboration with uh, Professor Nundi from IIT Guwahati, Professor Patro from Bongobash Evening College, and Ipshita, uh, who is a PhD student at our group and also the previous speaker. Um, so within the scope of these works, uh, we looked at B2U decays from uh, within the standard model, mainly uh, related to VUB extraction and also the scope of B2U decays in, in uh, probing beyond standard model physics. And when I uh, say B2U, uh, at least these two papers are basically based on B2 pi and B2 rho exclusive semi-leptonic mesonic decays. We are uh, a global an analysis is, is underway. So uh, I'd like to start with um, the, the scenario uh, for, for B2U decays at the point of time when we started on this project. So obviously exclusive B2 pi decays had been used for VUB extraction already, the exclusive estimate of VUB. Um, and on the new physics side, uh, many phenomenological analysis had already been done, uh, taking cue from the B2C sector from the RD and RD star observables where we take new physics effects to be, where we take uh, taonic found final states to be sensitive to new physics effects. And um, the, the lighter leptons, we, we considered them to be standard model like. Um, so uh, there was, uh, there are two estimates. So VUB can be estimated from both inclusive and exclusive decays. Uh, however, in the inclusive sector, the, the situation for VUB inclusive extraction is not as, as happy as VCB inclusive because there is considerable background from B2CL new decays. Uh, so one has to employ experimental cuts uh, to separate the B2U from the B2C region. And this rest restricts us to a part of the phase space where operator product expansion breaks down and sensitivity to non perturbative aspects increases. Uh, the exclusive measurement of UB at that point of time was primarily due to HFLAV, uh, who used the uh, most recent uh, data uh, on binned B2 pi L new branching ratios. Here, by L, we only mean the lighter leptons. Uh, due to Babar and Bell ranging from 2011 to 2013, sorry, starting from 2011 to 2013. The problem, the problem here was that HFLAV actually um, cooked up an average binned data set from all these different uh, uh, experimental data sets. And they extracted their view B uh, uh, after fitting to that averaged binned data set. Now the problem is that uh, the p-value of the averaging was, was not very satisfactory, 6%. And in fact, we to cross-check our, our, our initial approach, we actually did the averaging and the p-value that we uh, came to was even lower than that. So our concern was that extracting a value for a VUB from, from such a, a data set uh, would, would might, might lead to a biased result. At the point of time when we started this project, there was a dis dis discrepancy of about 2.2 sigma between the inclusive and exclusive measurements of UB. And uh, again, as I was uh, uh, speaking about earlier, um, from remembering the RD star uh, observable from the B2 C town new and CL new sector, uh, on the new physics side, we define observables, which are ratios of tau in the final state to E mu in the final state. And uh, in such ratios, obviously, VUB cancels, and hence the dominant source of such um, new physics observables are basically the form factors. Um, so the theory, um, I would not take much time on this slide because the, the audience is obviously um, an expert and, and probably knows and know, obviously knows everything that I've present here. So this is the effective Hamiltonian written at the B scale uh, for a B to U L new transition um, where these are the Wilson coefficients in, in, in telling the short distance physics and these are the operators. Uh, here, are the, here are all the five operators that can uh, contribute to, to a B2U decay, a B2UL new decay, uh, obviously with uh, the neutrinos assumed to be left-handed. And in the standard model, OV1 is the only operator. 
and these these are the uh, differential decay widths for uh, B two pi tau nu and B two rho tau nu, including all possible uh, new physics effects, vectorial, scalar, and and tensorial. Right. So uh, uh, on as as theoretical inputs and experimental inputs, obviously you we use a the data set, the exact same data set for B two pi that that H flag used, uh, Babar and Bell from twenty eleven to twenty thirty to twenty thirteen. Uh, for B two rho, the data is a bit scarce compared to B two pi, and these boxed uh, guys are the only ones who uh, offer a data or a binned data on B two rho. So we take that into account. Uh, for form factors, we for B two pi, it's it's uh, the, the the situation is quite happy from a phenomenologist's point of view. There are lattice uh, form factors due to MILC and UKQCD. We need tensorial form factors for the new physics analysis, and lattice uh, gives us that also. Uh, for uh, the low Q square behavior, you know, to constrain the low Q square behavior of 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 uh, the differential decay distribution, we have form factors due to uh, gubernari. Kokulu and Danny Van Dyke. I, my apologies if, if the pronunciations are incorrect. Uh, so these guys and uh, Leliak, Melich, and Danny Van Dyke. So these two papers uh, are the most recent papers that we know of that that uh, provide the LCSR form factors. LMD use a two two particle twist two pion light cone distribution amplitude and hence are more precise than GKD. Which is an LO calculation with an ill known B meson LCDA. For B2 rho, uh, there are no lattice uh, form factors. So we only have to um, depend on LCSR along with the experimental data, obviously. Uh, GKD provide uh, LCSR estimates for B2 rho as well, along with uh, another paper by Barucha, Straub, and Zwicky. So these guys used twist three and order of alpha S. Corrections using the Rho meson light cone distribution amplitude, whereas GKD only use a narrow width approximation. So again, BSZ is more uh, precise than GKD, but we in incorporate both of them. And for parameterizing our form factor series, we use uh, the two well-known, uh, by now well-known uh, parameterizations in, in, in the community, the BSZ and the BCL parameterizations. Uh, right. So uh, what we actually thought of was that uh, we did not want to average. So our our uh, plan was to you know not meddle with the data or meddle with the data as 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 less as possible. So we took all the data, and you have to remember that uh, the data produced provided by various organizations, the bin size of the data uh, are not similar. They vary between Babar and Bin. Uh, so um, we took the data on phase value. We did not uh, do any averaging. We be basically our plan was to look for outliers or or observables that is bins which are uh, which deviate from the data um, and will 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 shortly uh, quantify the deviation. So we look for data which which were outliers using both inclusive and exclusive DUB. Obviously, the common outliers uh, uh, are, the, are the problematic ones. So, for uh, the inclusive value of UB, we used um, uh, an average uh, provided by Bell. It was the most recent uh, average, and it 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 uh, incorporated uh, measurements by five different authors. I mean, five different papers. Since UB inclusive, as I explained in the first slide, is is highly model dependent. Depending on how you model the shape function and and the non perturbative QC effects, so these are our uh, d gamma dq square plots for the neutral and charged BDKs with the data overlaid upon them. So the uh, blue and yellow bands are for BSD and BCL respectively, and uh, the crosshairs are uh, the different uh, experiments you can make out from the color code here. What we see is that most of the data, especially for neutral BDKs, is pretty well explained with, with the current view B inclusive value. Uh, and even for, for um, the, 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 the charged B, the scenario is, is can be marked as a happy scenario. There are a few outliers, yes, and we mark them and keep them aside. Then we uh, uh, go to our analysis part where we define three different data sets. 
And these data sets were defined basically with respect to how we treat the Babar data because Babar 2011 uh, provides correlations, systematic uh, uh, um, and statistical correlations between the binned data is only for the combined modes where they combine both the uh, charges of B, B0 and B+. Plus. Whereas Bobart 2012 provides them for both combined and uh, the, 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 the charged and neutral mode separately. So our FIT1 uh, data set was one where we took the Bell data sets, uh, B0 and B- minus uh, decays from the Bell data sets and then combine them with the combined modes of Babar and Babar 2011 and 2012. Uh, FIT 2 was everything was, uh, 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 we do, did not want to include any combined modes. So we had to drop Babar 2011 from FIT 2. And fit, in FIT 3, we had everything in terms of their particular uh, charges, except Babar 2011. And in every data set, we uh, made a further um, classification uh, data set A was the experimental data along with lattice and B, uh, we added LCSR to, to A. Doing all that, uh, uh, we carried out a chi-square fit and a Bayesian analysis, both of them. Um, obviously, since the data is abundant, uh, the values do not differ much. And this is how our results for the different uh, data uh, fits, uh, for the different fit data sets compared to the existing uh, estimates by uh, inclusive estimates due to HFLAV, Bell, uh, and the exclusive estimates due to HFLAV. So the thick lines are basically the fit results with all of the data sets included. And the thin lines are the, uh, the uh, result for VUB uh, after we drop the ill-behaved data sets, which we have taken uh, to be the ones with pull greater than two. Uh, and the thin black lines are basically the inclusive measurements due to uh, uh, various authors reported by HFLAV. Um, uh, so this is the scenario that we arrived at. And then we went ahead and um, compared uh, the inclusive to the exclusive scenario. Five minutes. So this is, yeah. Uh, so this is the exclusive inclusive uh, scenario with all the bins that have pulls greater than two um, listed. And these are uh, the same for our exclusive fits. And we see that these two are the problematic bins. Uh, sorry, yeah, the problematic bins are the problematic observables. So to deal with them, we uh, cook up three more data sets where we uh, um, take off the 18 to 20 Bell 11 bill uh, bin from 2B and call it 2B1. Uh, omit the 20 to 26.4 bin from 3B, call it 3B1, and omit both 18 to 20 and 20 to 26.4 from 3B and call it 3B2. So uh, these are our corresponding fit results, and this is our final result. Uh, we quote the BCL uh, estimate for uh, the BCL frequentist and Bayesian estimates for VUB as our final result. And uh, the deviation between these exclusive estimates and the corresponding Bell inclusive uh, measurement is, is, was uh, brought down to less than one sigma. And as an update, I'd like to mention here that using the Melich LCSR data set, which did not exist at the point of time when we archived this, uh, we did a quick analysis and we found out that the uh, central value comes down a bit along with the uncertainty, obviously, since that is the more precise data set. Right, so on the new physics analysis side, we followed a similar procedure for B2Pi, we had three data sets, FIT1, LCSR plus Lattice. In FIT2, we had everything added, uh, uh, every experimental data set uh, apart from Baba 2011. And in FIT3, we cooked up a synthetic data set by normalizing the uh, branching ratio for B2 tau nu with the binned B2 pi data from each data set uh, that we used in FIT2. And for B2 rho, we normalized the binned B2 rho L nu by the integrated B2 pi L nu. So this normalization was obviously done uh, with the target of you know, canceling VUB on the theoretical side so that we don't have to fit VUB in these bits. 
Um, so, and in for the B2 row normalizations, we took care of the charges. That is a B plus two pi DK was normalized by, uh, sorry, a B plus two row DK was normalized by B plus two pi DK. And we used the integrated values from the same, same experiment. So the B2 row estimates corresponding to Bell 2013 were uh, normalized by the B2 pi integrated value reported by the Bell 2013 experiment and so on. So this is the uh, new physics, complete new physics dependent B2 town new branching ratio, theoretical expression for the same. These are the values, uh, uh, the integrated, uh, for the integrated B2 pi L new branching ratios that we use for normalizing. These are the various observables that we propose that will probe uh, beyond standard model physics in, in B2U DKs. And these are some of some limits that we could arrive at in the B2 pi sector because B2 pi town U has an upper limit uh, reported in PDG. So you use that upper limit and you can have these experimental limits on, on the new physics observables. Armed with all of that, these are our results. So these are the B2 pi fit results and the corresponding standard model estimates for the different fit scenarios. These are the new physics solutions. So the fit results for new physics taken one at a time. Uh, obviously, since B2 tau does not, yeah, sorry. So uh, uh, obviously, since B2 tau only depends on CV1, CV2, and CP, these are the only uh, solutions that you can arrive at from the fits that I just described. And these are the corresponding new physics observables corresponding to uh, these solutions. Uh, similar for uh, B2 row, for B2 row, we present our results uh, in n equal to three and n equal to two cases where n is basically the cutoff in the form factor parameterization series. These are the standard model predictions. And these are the new physics predictions corresponding obviously to the same solutions of CV1, CV2, and CP. Uh, these are uh, the behaviors of our observables with respect to different uh, new physics taken one at a time um, for B2 pi and B2 rho. So I would just like to mention two, uh, um, you know, two features here. Number one is that not all new physics observables are uh, sensitive to uh, all kinds of new physics. So that is obviously, uh, um, that becomes clear once you look at the particular definition of the observable. The second one is these red cross hairs are basically the new physics solutions that are discarded by the corresponding, the current experimental limits. And you can only do this for B2Pi because no uh, experimental limits exist for semi-leptonic tau and uh, subject to B2 rho. Um, so, uh, these are the main results in the NP part. And finally, to conclude, uh, I, I would also like to present a few uh, asymmetric and polarization observables that we predicted in our paper for B2 pi and for B2 rho. Uh, thank you. That will be all for my side. Thank you very much. That's a a lot of material there. <clears throat> Interesting to see what's going on in uh, in B2U tra transitions. Are there any questions? Yes, Guy. Um, on the long term, uh, we think of measuring uh, lambda B to P town U. So mm -hmm. that would be RP uh, that you did not mention. Is it something uh, especially interesting or not about this uh, decay? No, so basically that will be a baryonic decay, right? Yeah. Yeah, so in the course of these two papers, so the first paper was uh, simply uh, on VUB extraction where we kind of tried to resolve, I mean, see if we can resolve or bring down the tension between uh, exclusive and inclusive estimates of VUB. And since the exclusive estimate of VUB prior to our work was due to HFLAV who used the B2 pi modes only, we, we just use those modes. Uh, but yes, a global analysis will entail baryonic modes also. And uh, we, we are on that. We, we will be, we are obviously thinking about that and working on that probably in the future. Thank you.
I can't hear you, Martin. Ah, oh, that's uh, because yeah. I'm not saying anything because you didn't say that I was uh, it was uh, so not to speak. <laughs> um, right. Um, so I was wondering um, about your comments to the href uh, sort of uh, average of the bin data, right? Yes. So. Uh, as a general remark, I think when HFLAF, uh, as you put it, like fiddles with the data, they usually have a very good reason for that. Yeah. So, um, and, and I, I would suspect, but I actually, I, I don't know in this case, but I would suspect that they are taking into account like correlations between systematics from different experiments or something like that. So uh, could you comment on, uh, on, or have you talked to the um, person or, pe uh, or people yes. who did uh, this average from HLEF or could somebody from HLEF comment on that? Yes, actually from our side, uh, what I can say is that um, there's a completely, I, I did not specifically put that part in, 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 in our talk due to the time constraint because we have an entire section in our paper. We did communicate to them uh, we also let them know that our p-value and their p-values were not matching. We, uh, as I as I explained, that we did the averaging and we achieved a p-value which is further less than H flap. Um, so they know about this, yes, but uh, there is no, you know, uh, there's no. We 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 did not reach at a resolution in in terms of p-values or in terms of optimizing. The average data set. So basically, we thought it best to, you know, treat the data as the experimentalists have provided us, uh, because we already the community already knows what happens when you average over them. So we just went out and to 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 you know and 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 just and just wanted to you know verify what what happens if we treat them at, at, as they are and and not average over them. Okay. Okay, I <clears throat> my my Zoom window is just at the edge of crashing, so I think it's the it's good that we reached the end of uh, this session. That was a very interesting session. Uh, many thanks for the to the speakers for the interesting talks and for keeping to their time. And uh, thanks for the discussion. We now have a coffee break until. Uh, 4.30 UK time, and after that, there are plenty of other sessions, including another flavor session. So, bye-bye, uh, everybody, and probably see many of you there. Bye, Patrick. Thanks very much for sharing. Yeah. Welcome, Marco. I'll, I'll, I'll kill my Zoom window before I do anything else, because it's really, it's, it's dying. <laughs> I mean...